we've been in Hebrews 11 here for a long time. And, you know, when you sometimes when you get so focused on the, each individual verse, you lose track of the whole. And so what I wanted to do tonight was take a second. I want to read it. I'm going to read it in the CSB, Christian Standard Bible. It's a little different. Um, it's, not, it's not a paraphrase. It's in between. Um, sometimes just reading a translation, reading a passage you've been studying in a different translation, you see things, you, it, and it sparks. As opposed to if you read the same passage over and over and over, sometimes my, my brain goes on autopilot, and I'm no longer really listening. And so that's why I just... I, I, constantly reading these different translations. Unless I'm trying to memorize it, I'm going to read them in different translations. So my encouragement is as we read through, I'm just going to read through this chapter, the CSB. If you just want to sit back, you can read, this, you can read the scriptures on there. Or you can close your eyes and listen. But the thing is to listen to what is God saying. What stands out? What jumps out as, as I read it? What kind of like, oh, I forgot about that. Because that's something that the Lord is underlining in your heart. That's something the Lord wants you to pay attention to. So Listening to the Spirit, what is he saying to you as we read through Hebrews 11, verse 1? Now, faith is the reality of what is hoped for, the proof of what is not seen. For by this, our ancestors were approved. By faith, we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. By faith, Abel offered to God a better sacrifice than Cain did. By faith, he was approved as a righteous man because God approved his gifts. And even though he is dead, he still speaks through his faith. By faith, Enoch was taken away. And so he did not experience death. He was not to be found because God took him away. For before he was taken away, he was approved as one who pleased God. Now, without faith... It's impossible to please God, since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. By faith, Noah, after he was warned about what was not yet seen and motivated by godly fear, built an ark to deliver his family. By faith, he condemned the world and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. By faith, Abraham, when he was called, obeyed and set out for a place that he was going to receive as an inheritance. He went out, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he stayed as a foreigner in the land of promise, living in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, co-heirs of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. By faith, even Sarah herself, when she was unable to have children, received power to conceive offspring, even though she was past the age, since she considered that the one who had promised was faithful. Therefore, from one man, in fact, from one as good as dead, came offspring as numerous as the stars of the sky and as innumerable as the grains of sand along the seashore. These all died in faith, although they had not received the things that were promised. But they saw them from a distance, greeted them, and confessed that they were foreigners and temporary residents on the earth. Now, those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they were thinking about where they came from, they would have had an opportunity to return but they now desire a better place, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. He received the promises, and yet he was offering his one and only son, the one to whom it had been said, your offspring will be traced through Isaac. He considered God to be able even to raise someone from the dead. Therefore, he received him back, figuratively speaking. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau concerning things to come. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, and he worshiped, leaning on the top of his staff. By faith, Joseph 
as he was nearing the end of his life, mentioned the exodus of the Israelites and gave instructions concerning his bones. By faith, Moses, after he was born, was hidden by his parents for three months because they saw that the child was beautiful and they didn't fear the king's edict. By faith, Moses, when he'd grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter and chose to suffer with the people of God rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin. For he considered reproach for the sake of Christ to be greater wealth than the treasures of Egypt, since he was looking ahead to the reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not being afraid of the king's anger, for Moses persevered as one who sees him who is invisible. By faith, he instituted the Passover and the sprinkling of the blood so that the destroyer of the firstborn might not touch the Israelites. By faith, they crossed the Red Sea as though they were on dry ground dry land. And when the Egyptians attempted to do this, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell down after being marched around by the Israelites for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, welcomed the spies in peace and didn't perish with those who disobeyed. And what more can I say? Time is too short for me to tell about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, Samuel, the prophets, who by faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the raging of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, gained strength and weakness, became mighty in battle, and put foreign armies to flight. Women received back their dead, raised to life again. Other people were tortured, not accepting release so that they might gain a better resurrection. Others experienced mockings and scourgings as well as bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawed in two, they died by the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and on mountains, hiding in caves and holes in the ground. All these were approved through faith, through their faith, but they did not receive what was promised since God had provided something better for us so that they would not be made perfect without us. Amazing passage. This is the hall of faith. All these people that have been highlighted and brought out and yet, what did the Lord speak to you? Where was it that God underlined for you? As I was reading this, I was reminded that verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised. In some cases, like Abraham, he's told you're gonna inherit the promised land, right? And he's told he's gonna have lots of sons and many sons had father Abraham, right? He did have many sons, but the only land he really owned was a gravesite. He, here's this guy with great wealth, and yet he was a nomad in the promised land because his home was not Israel. His home was that city whose builder and architect is God. In other words, his focus was there in heaven. They greeted them from afar and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. He knew, they had this vision that this, is, this world is not my home. Why am I so upset that it's not the way I want it to be? I'm only passing through. The problem is that passing through sometimes is 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 years. But that was the perspective. I'm passing through. This is not the end. Verse 14, for people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had the opportunity to return. In other words, if they really wanted to go back, they could have, but they didn't go back. They went forward, even though in some cases it cost them their lives. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God for he has prepared for them a city. The end of the passage highlights the same thing again. It's like, that was his theme from the beginning. I'm, I'm showing you all these different great people of faith. I'm showing you what they did and how they did it for God and how their focus was on God. And as a result, God empowered them to walk the spirit-filled life. But 
Not all of them had it good. Not all of them had the blessing. Verse 36, others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. And last week, that's what we talked about, the, the suffering, the persecuted church around the world. There are thousands of Christians that will die this month simply because they name Christ as their Lord. And sometimes we get upset because somebody calls us a crazy Christian or somebody calls us a weak because we're a Christian or that we're bigoted or foolish. They're not throwing stones yet. They were stoned, they were sawn in two, they were killed. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy, wandering about in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. In other words, because this world was not the home, they didn't settle in, and sometimes they lived, sometimes they lived in poverty. And it's, it's, it's weird. In the church today, we have two errors that sometimes, you know, it's like Satan doesn't care which side of the boat you fall out of. He likes to, you know, he'll, he'll, he'll rock this side of the boat, and so then you'll lean over on this side, and then what happens? You fall out of the boat the other side, okay? And so there are lots of ways you can do that. One, of course, is the prosperity gospel. The prosperity gospel says over here, um, name it and claim it. If you grab it, you grab it. You, just, the, you speak it, and you're going to speak it into existence just like God did. And the problem is that doesn't line up with the rest of the scriptures, okay? Yes, our words have power, and yes, we need to pray in faith, and yet they've taken that kernel of truth and they've expanded it into a big lie, and that's part of Satan's lie. Now, that's one side of the boat that you can fall out of. The other side of the boat that you can fall out of is taking this verse and going to the poverty gospel. And the poverty gospel says everybody should be poor. In other words, if you really love God, you shouldn't own anything. Jesus called the rich young ruler to give up everything he had and to follow God. Yeah, that's true for the rich young ruler. And yet God speaks to each of us individually. What is he calling you to do? He called the rich young ruler to do that because wealth was his God. He, you remember the rich young ruler also said, you know, have you, have you obeyed the commandments? And he's like, oh, all of them, since, my, since I was a kid. And he's like, really? Well, do this one thing, just sell all that you have Show me that your wealth is not your God. He doesn't say it that way, but that's when you read between the lines, that's what he's saying. Show me that wealth is not your God. Sell it all, give it away to the poor and come follow me. And of course he goes away and Jesus is brokenhearted over that. Now, is that what God calls all of us? Some of us, yeah. Some of us, that's what God's called us to. Some of us that it's not wrong to have wealth as long as the wealth doesn't have you, but sometimes we use that as an excuse to, to not press into where God wants us to press in. Here he's talking at the end about these people that they had, you know, they'd given up everything, that they're suffering. They're wandering around in sheep and, and goat skins, destitute, afflicted, mistreated. I don't see any sheep skins around here. Okay. And thankfully I don't see any furs either, the other, other extreme. All right, we got those, we don't see those things, but, but where, where is our heart? Where is our treasure? Is our treasure in this world? We're gonna be disappointed. Or is our treasure in the world that's to come and we're investing it ahead? Now, and then it says here, of these, the world was not worthy. Basically, the world looked on and said, you're not worthy. And yet God is saying, no, the world was not worthy of them. I like, this reminds me of, the, of some of the great missionaries. And I think it is so powerful to read the biographies biographies and autobiographies of different missionaries. And you read these stories and you're, you're convicted, you're impressed. It's like, wow. You know, whether it, uh, it's Keith Green with like the book, No Compromise, or The Heavenly Man, Brother Yoon. Um, I love that story about him just walking by faith. And, you know, the, he fasted like 77 days or something ridiculous that only by the grace of God is even possible. But that's just it, these things. Hudson Taylor's spiritual secret. How many of you read that, the story about Hudson Taylor? What? No one? Hudson Taylor's Spiritual Secret. It's like one of the best biographies. Okay, that's what it's called. Hudson Taylor's Spiritual Secret. That's the book. And basically, here's this guy. He feels called to missions in China. He lives in England, and he's just like, his heart is breaking for the, at that time, I don't know what it was. It wasn't a billion people that were in China, but at that time, it was still this huge country that didn't know the gospel. And so his heart's burdened and he wants to live by faith. And there's so many amazing stories where he's like, he felt like he didn't want the Lord, he, the Lord told him not to ask his boss to get paid. Like 
He's supposed to get paid, but not to remind his boss. Well, his, mind, his boss is forgetting to remind him to get paid. His, his boss is forgetting to pay him. And so he's serving week after week, and he normally gets paid once a week. And he's like, I have no food. And he's, he's, he's at this place, and he sees this young woman with a baby, and they're, like, they're destitute, and all he has is like the equivalent of like $10, okay? And he's like, this is my last thing. This is what I've got to eat on. My boss owes me two weeks worth of pay, but he hasn't paid me. But this is, and he's like, you know what? You need this more than I do. And he gives away his last, his last $10 to this young mom. And that night, his boss is like, you know what? I haven't paid you. But it was that step of faith. He, he had to give away everything. And, and it was interesting too, because he said, he felt the call to missions. And he said, Lord, help me to walk by faith. And what was the walking by faith? It was those little steps. It was those little steps that, that strengthened the faith muscles for the bigger steps because he had to pray in every dollar to support him in missions. He was Hudson Taylor. Anyway, Hudson Taylor's spiritual secret. I won't tell you what the spiritual secret is because you've got to read the book to understand what the spiritual secret is. But it's fascinating because um, I mean, it's just, it's very inspiring. Hudson Taylor's spiritual secret. At least somebody here needs to read that between now and, and next week, Okay. <laughs> That's the assignment. Um, also, how many of you have read The Heavenly Man by Brother Yoon? Okay, a few more people. That's good. Um, that's also inspiring. Man, and he's a modern day uh, Chinese uh, missionary. Um, you know, he's praying for God to give him a Bible because they didn't have Bibles. And then supernaturally, God sends somebody to his door to give him, I mean, just testimony after testimony of God. He's in prison and he's basically told to leave the prison. Um, an angel basically escorts him out of the prison, like a modern day story of Peter. Um, and the, the guards didn't see him. I mean, just story after story. These are stories that inspire us and encourage us to step out of faith. Because honestly, if you live in the United States, you've got it pretty easy compared to what's going on in the world. I mean, you may be going through tough times. We're all going through stuff that's like, ah, oh, frustrating. But when we read these other stories, it reminds us, it's like, wow, as bad as I have it, it's not as bad as what they're suffering in North Korea right now. The worst place to be a Christian on the planet. So all these, though commended through faith, did not receive what was promised since God had promised something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. What they hadn't received. What was it that they hadn't received? It was Jesus. Jesus, all these people were pre they, they were all in the Old Testament. They had not received Jesus. You and I are actually, in a sense, more blessed, if you will, gifted, because we have received Jesus. It's funny, on, on Facebook, we posted this week, you know, if you could see anything, in the, live in any time in the Bible, when would you live or what would you do? And people are going to see this. And, and yet God is saying in this passage right here that you and I are more blessed to live now than anybody else in prior history. In fact, I believe that it's our generation that will see the coming of Christ in the clouds. That's gonna be better than anything. So let's live like that. Let's live for that. Let's live with that anticipation. Um, the, uh, I like this quote, until Jesus' atoning work on the cross was accomplished, no salvation was complete. No matter how great the faith a believer had, their salvation was based on what Christ would do Ours is based on Christ, what Christ has done. Their faith looks forward to a promise. Ours looks back to a historical fact. That's why it says that they're not complete without us. It was not until Christ. And also because uh, we don't have time to go there right now, but in 1 Thessalonians 4, it says that when Jesus comes back, he's bringing with him all who died. And they're gonna receive the resurrection body. We're gonna receive the resurrection body. So right now, all those saints that are recorded there in the Old Testament and all the saints that have died in Jesus are with the Lord, but they don't have their resurrected body yet. They're waiting for it. And God says, we all, this is what the, the book of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews is saying, you're all gonna get it at the same time. It's like Christmas is all gonna happen at the same time. The real Christmas, the real Christ coming, second coming, if you will, second Christmas. All right, so tonight, here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to do. In your groups, uh, I'm gonna go in reverse no, I'm not gonna go in reverse order. I'm gonna tell you three things. Um, first is we're gonna, in your groups, you're gonna pray first, and I'm gonna explain what you're gonna pray about in a moment. Um, then the leader's gonna lead. One of the things to, to consider talking about is what are some 
some biographies, Christian biographies, like missionary biographies that inspire you? And what is it that inspires you about them? Because usually that's an area that God is challenging us to grow. Um, and then examine your heart. Um, these people, these people that we were just reading about had this mentality that this world is not their home. I want you to give, give, you, give you an example. If you go on vacation, all right, how many of you, when you go on vacation, if you're staying at a, um, you know, a timeshare or a nicer hotel, they, they may have, or your Airbnb, they may have a dresser, right? That has empty, empty drawers, right? How many of you, when you get to the, 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 the place that you're staying at, you've got your suitcase, do you empty your suitcase and put it in the drawers? How many of you do that? Okay, how many of you are like, I got the suitcase. I don't wanna unpack the suitcase. I'll just live out of the suitcase. And when I'm done, I'll close the suitcase and go. How many of you are like that? Okay, about one third, two thirds, okay. So, so the question is, when you go to there, okay, and, I, and I, I'm, like, I'm like, I don't wanna have to, I had enough problems just packing my suitcase. So I live out of my suitcase. And every once in a while, I'm like, uh, if we're gonna be here for a few days, then I'll unpack it. But I'm like, but then I'll have to pack it again anyway. Anyway. But here's the question. Do you go out, do you go out and buy artwork and bring it? You, you, you buy like a thousand dollar piece of artwork and, and put it on your hotel wall? Has anybody ever done that? <laughs> Does anybody go and say, you know what? This hotel room, it would really look nice with new curtains. Let me go buy some new curtains and, and set up in this hotel room. Or do you go out into that, to that hotel room and or you're shopping, and it's like, I really want i really like a nicer bed. I mean, I'm only gonna be here for four days, but I'm gonna spend $3,000 to get a nicer bed for these three days that I'm here because I wanna get a good night's sleep and it's worth it for me, right? They may have done that? <laughs> no, because you're only there for a short time. You're only there. And so the question is, are you living with the hotel room mindset or are you living with... Are you living like you're investing in your hotel, rather? That's the question. Are you investing in your hotel room and trying to make your hotel room this, this amazing thing? Or are you investing in eternity, recognizing, I'm only in the hotel room for a short time? Ask yourself that. Let the Lord search your heart. God, may you bless our time, our time together in sharing and praying. May you accomplish your purposes. Take us deeper, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.